let's go ahead and get our Bibles out tonight then. And we're going to be in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. And we are going to uh, continue our study tonight. We've uh, been in the last uh, month or so or more on uh, Mission Impossible. We've seen God step into the lives of people facing uh, impossible situations where everybody else says there's no hope. And we've seen Jesus, of course, come in and provide that hope and uh, solve the needs for people. We're going to look at another case tonight. I'm excited about tonight. I told you last week or two weeks ago, uh, the mission of the supernatural smorgasbord. And what a, what a way to uh, have a service tonight. We're going to talk about food. Amen. And uh, I love smorgasbords. I love buffets. You eat as much as you want. Leave miserable. And uh, you going to blame yourself for it the rest of the day. But uh, uh, all you can eat, right? And we're going to see in this case uh, this evening from this particular passage of Scripture, uh, God step into an impossible situation and do something just amazing uh, with it. So we'll look at that tonight. So if you found 1 Kings 17, go ahead and stand with me if you would. Out of respect for the reading of God's Word, I don't have it on there for you. You're going to have to look in your Bibles tonight. Chapter 17, and we're going to start in verse 8, and we'll read down through verse 16. So if you do, don't have a Bible with you, I apologize. I didn't get it on the, on the screen for tonight, so maybe peek off of somebody else's this evening. So look at uh, verse number 8, where we'll pick up, 1 Kings 17. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, uh, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was gathering, uh, was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after uh, make for thy, thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and said, uh, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. Uh, thank you for the time we've had to sing, uh, to hear from our, our new missionaries, Lord. And then also, uh, Lord, just to hear the testimony and the praising of your people, Lord. Uh, you truly are good to us, and may we never forget to praise your name. And Lord, we ask you tonight now, as we open your word for the next few minutes, we pray that you'll bless the teaching and the preaching this evening. Uh, may we continue as, as we continue to study these impossible situations. May you continue to just encourage us in the Lord, encourage us in your power and in your strength and in your might. And we be thankful, Lord, that we serve the God who always can, the God who nothing is impossible for. May we be thankful for that, Lord. May we lean on you in those difficult times, knowing that you'll see us through, we pray. We ask you now to bless the time of preaching. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this evening. The uh, story or the account that takes place in 1 Kings 17 is, of course, the fascinating prophet Elijah. There are some very colorful people in Scripture. I think Elijah is one of them. Uh, this is an account that really shows the power of God in action. Uh, when, you, when you think about Elijah, uh, probably you don't think about this particular case. You probably think about him standing up to King Ahab, you know, and, and big old wicked Jezebel, right? You, those are so some of the first things that come. You think about uh, him facing off with the prophets of Baal and calling fire down from heaven, right? Those are the things you typically think about, and, and, and God did those things in Elijah's ministry. Uh, but I think whether whatever situation you look at in Elijah's life, including this one, uh, you always see a mighty display of the power of God. This was not Elijah. This was God. Uh, Elijah was the conduit through which God worked and the power of God fell this day and every other day. He was simply God's man doing God's work, God's way, and God used him in a big way to accomplish his will. Um, you know, Elijah, though, if you think about Elijah, he didn't just wake up one day 
and have the power of God. Okay? He didn't just wake up one day and miraculously be used of God. He, 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 he faced the prophets of Baal on the mountain, which is probably the most familiar thing we remember about Elijah in that powerful situation. It took him a lot of things to get there. He didn't just wake up and say, I'm going on the, on the mountain and, and calling down fire and, and proving the prophets of Baal wrong. God prepared him again and again and again, put him in situations and circumstances that looked difficult and impossible before he ever got him to the mountain to face off with the prophets of Baal. Uh, again and again, God proved in Elijah's life, I'm able. I'm capable. Uh, I'll work in your life if you'll just trust me through every situation. Think about it. Before he ever faced the, the mountain and, and the calling down of the fire from heaven for the prophets of Baal, uh, he, he had to stand before Ahab, the most powerful man in the land, and declare judgment from God upon the nation. He, he told him, it's not going to rain until I say so. And, of course, God's going to tell me when that is. Uh, and, of course, that's exactly what happened. But, but could you imagine being put in that situation to have to go to the king of the land and say, hey, look, buddy. Here's the judgment of God. It's not going to rain. That's going to cause a famine and a drought. People are going to starve to death. People are going to die. And it's your fault, but that's the judgment. And I'm one that's just telling you about it. He, he had to face that. Uh, th then after that, think about this. He sent Elijah to an isolated stream in the wilderness and said, uh, you, you live here for a while and I'll have the birds feed you. Right? And that was great, but you had to rely on birds to feed him. Well, eventually that stream ran out. That dried up. There was no rain. It's kind of like Arizona. Elijah lived in Arizona for a portion of his life. Amen. And that, that, that stream dried up. And, and so after that, God said, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I knew that was going to happen. I had a divine plan for all this. I want you to go to a little town called Zarephath. And I want you to find a little widow lady there. And she's going to take care of you. And he does that. All of those things, Elijah looked at those. We would look at those things and say, wow, that's tough. Those are difficult circumstances. But God used every one of those circumstances to prepare him before he ever faced the prophets of Baal. So it wasn't just a one time, hey, look at me, I'm facing the prophets of Baal. God prepared him and prepared him and prepared him. And by the way, he does that in our life many times. He lets us face those seemingly impossible situations. And then he shows himself real and powerful in them to build us up and prepare us for the next one. Because they happen often in our lives, don't they? We face times in our life where we, we're not sure how we're going to make it. And God says, I know. I know, and he prepares us for those things. Uh, you know, when I think about that, I can't help but think, God used Elijah in such a special way. And you know, I've never called down fire from heaven. Uh, I don't know that I ever will. But I'm thankful that God uses us in special ways as well. I may never have the name that Elijah had. I, I may never be the man of God Elijah was. But I'm thankful God can use us and use you and use me in a very special way if we'll just simply surrender. And if we'll simply say, yes, Lord, and if we'll simply say, it may look impossible with my human eyes, but God, you've got this. You're the God of the impossible. So as we look at this particular uh, passage of Scripture this morning, we look at the supernatural smorgasbord. I want to I give us, again, just some hope for an impossible situation. Some encouragement for something that seems hopeless to everybody else until God steps in. And so I want to look at that tonight, this little widow lady here in the town of Zarephath. Uh, let's look at our outline tonight. I actually have one for you, like I did not this morning. Uh, number one, <laughs> number one, we see a hopeless predicament. We see a hopeless predicament. You ever been in one of those? We probably all have at some time in our life, right? A hopeless predicament. Verse number 10 of our text introduces us to a poor widow lady. She is the focus of this passage. Yes, we, we see Elijah's name. Yes, God steps in and does something tremendous. But she is really the focal point of the passage. Her description shows us just how hopeless her situation was. Let's look at her for just a minute, okay? First of all, look at her place in life. One of the first things we learn about her is, number one, she's a widow. Okay? Uh, number two, she lives in a place called Zarephath. Now, and again, you might not think, well, big deal. It's just telling us her hometown. Let me explain. Number one, first of all, a widow is a difficult position to be in today, let alone back in Bible days. Uh, in this particular time in society, uh, most women were largely dependent on their husbands for their, for their life, for their food, for their shelter, for their, for their clothing, for everything, for protection. It was dependent on the husband. She doesn't have one. She's a widow. You find out in verse number 12, not only is she a widow, she has a son. So now she's put in the, in, the, in the difficult situation to have to provide for herself in a man's world and a child at the same time. Uh, so she's responsible for her care as well as the care of her child. Now, that's bad enough in Israel. She doesn't live in Israel. 
She lives in a town called Zarephath. In Zarephath, it's even harder. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, in the law for God's people in Israel, uh, they were commanded to take care of those widows. They were commanded to take care of the poor. And, and for some of the ones that maybe had more, to make sure they shared and took care of those that are less fortunate than them and those who truly had those types of needs. Well, Zarephath had no connection to the law of God. This was a Gentile town. They, they didn't follow these principles that God had laid out for Israel. Uh, the poor in most Gentile nations were on your own. Figure it out. So this woman is in a very bad place in life. This is not an enjoyable situation for her. She is struggling. But it gets worse. It gets worse if you look at her life. Look at her problems in life. How many of you have problems? <laughs> we all do. How many of you are sitting next to him? No, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I'm kidding. <laughs> How many of you have problems? We all have problems. Look, look at her problems. Like verse number 12, it shows us the depth of her poverty. Okay, she's a widow. She's living in a town that not necessarily is known for people supporting the widows and taking care of them and helping them. She's on her own. And look how, look how poverty-stricken she is in verse number 12. Uh, she says in verse number 12, Elijah had asked for just a morsel of bread. By the way, Elijah's not asking for a loaf of bread here. He's not asking for a foot-long Subway from Subway. He says, I just want a morsel of bread. Now, when I think about a morsel of bread, I think about, you know, a bite or two. That's, some, that's enough to make me mad. You know, I don't want just a bite or two. Give me the whole thing, right? Just a, just a morsel. Just enough to take the edge off, if you will. They didn't have snicker bars back then. So he just asked for a morsel of bread. Just, just a little bit. Uh, I'm not asking you to make me a sandwich. No, no trimmings. No meat. No cheese. No, no, no mayonnaise. Nothing. Just a morsel of bread. Small piece. And she replies this way. I have just a handful of meal in a barrel. And a little bit of oil in a cruise. And I'm gathering two sticks. And I'm going to take those two sticks. And use them to cook the last meal. The last of my food for my son and I. The final meal. And as you read verse number 12. It kind of shows her desperation. It kind of shows her, her serious plight in life. Uh, she is in a hopeless situation. She's, in her mind there's no way out of this. Here's what she has. I brought you a little uh, visual aid this morning. She's got a little bit, of, little bit of meal. She's got a little bit of oil. And two sticks. Two sticks. Emily found those for me. Aren't they cute? Thank you, Emily. Two sticks. That's all she has. And she says, I'm going to prepare this last little bit of food I have so that my son and I can eat. Now, think about the problems. Now, that leads us to the third point. Look at her plan in life. We see, we see how hopeless her situation is. We see the place she is. We see the problems she's having. What is her plan? How is she going to solve the problems? Here's her plan to solve the problems. You ready for this? Her plan is very simple. I'm going to take the two sticks. I'm going to take the last of my meal. I'm going to take the last of my oil. I'm going to go in and dress it or prepare it. I'm going to cook a meal for my son and I. We're going to eat it. And then we're going to starve to death. That's her plan. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? We're going to eat it. And then just wait for death to take us. This is a woman without hope. This is a situation you and I would look at and say, this is impossible. What is she going to do? She's got the same mentality. A woman who sees no way out of her situation. She's ready to embrace death for herself and for her son because there is no alternative. This is about as hopeless as it gets. Now, most of us have probably never faced this impossible of a situation quite like this. But we've all faced circumstances that we've looked at that appear to be hopeless. It might be a sickness in the body and it continues to deteriorate. It might be a fracture in a marriage that looks like it's never going get, to get, get repaired but only get worse. It might be a financial crisis that seems to grow worse day by day. It might be the death of a loved one and we're not sure how God's going to use that for good. Uh, it might be an ever-increasing ever increasing feeling of depression and anxiety in our lives uh, that fill our heart with hopelessness. It could be thousands of other things. But we face those at times in life, situations that are hopeless. You know, there are people in the Bible who felt that way. If you remember, Moses, after he killed the Egyptian and fled from, from Pharaoh, uh, he felt like he was in a hopeless situation. Elijah himself faced this. You, you remember after he killed the prophets of Baal? What did he do? He ran and hid because Jezze was after him. He was all depressed. God, just kill me. I'm no good. Jonah faced it in the belly of the whale. 
the disciples, when they found themselves in a storm, they faced a hopeless situation and, and worried and feared about it. Jacob, when he was told Joseph was dead, uh, uh, had this hopeless situation. David, uh, not just with Goliath, but even later in Psalms, when, when he talks about how his enemies rose up against him, David faced these. Good men in the Bible, and, and, scripture, and ladies in Scripture as well, face very difficult, hopeless situations. As well. It's not just us. This, is, this has been since the beginning of time. By the way, we're not exempt from it, okay? We'll face these times. Many people could be named. I think we understand what we're saying. A hopeless situation many times arises in our life. There appears to be no way out. This is exactly what this woman is facing. This is one of those things we'd look at her and just say, wow, wow, who's going to help her? Uh, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes recorded some despair times. And, and it kind of uh, makes us feel uh, at home sometimes because we face those situations. It's exactly what this woman is facing. A hopeless predicament. Let me give you number two, though. Number two, look at a humble present. A humble present. You know, this is, this is an encouraging story because in, fi- in, in spite of the fact that this woman truly was in a hopeless situation... God works in his poor widow's life to bring her to a place of absolute faith in him and his power. God does something in this widow's life that can only be attributed to the power of God. This is not government assistance. This, this is not financial aid. This is not a family member stepping in and saying, hey, let me take care of you. This is not the church. Help. This is only attributed to God. It's only attributed to God in the middle of her condition. Look, look at a couple things I, I put down about this thought. First of all, we see an unusual relationship. An unusual relationship. In verse number 9, uh, Elijah is told, go to Zarephath, and there's a widow there waiting on you. There's a widow there waiting on you. Now, let me just, let me just give you a little clarity here, because I talked about Zarephath being a Gentile nation. Does anybody know whose hometown Zarephath was? Queen Jezebel's. That's where Queen Jezzy was from. Now again, her and Elijah don't exactly get along. Okay? Her and, and her husband Elijah don't exactly get along. So he goes to the hometown of, 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 of this wicked queen, a Gentile nation, filled with worshipers to the fertility god Baal. Uh, think about it. This woman is a very unlikely candidate for God to use in this particular situation. Uh, look at where she's at. But God chose to send his prophet to this, to this pagan town, this home of this Gentile widow, who couldn't even take care of herself and her son, let alone the man of God, and that's where God sent him. Uh, of course, Elijah was God's man, but Elijah was also a wanted man. Uh, Ahab's looking for Elijah. Ahab hates Elijah. Ahab's got a, a bounty on Elijah's head, if you will. Uh, by the way, he's blaming, Ahab, or he's blaming Elijah for the, for the famine in the land. And the no rain, even though it was their fault and he just pronounced the judgment, Ahab has a a price on Elijah's head. Ahab wanted to kill him. It is kind of neat. God sends Elijah to the last place anybody would think to look for him. (laughs) Right in the middle of of Queen Jezebel's hometown. And this poor Gentile woman, by the way, if you think about it, most likely not not a convert, not, not a child of God. Uh, So he uses this woman who we would consider, hey, she's a sinner. She's not a good person. She's not an Israelite. She should be separate. And he uses this woman uh, who's also not just in a hopeless situation, but probably lost in her sin, not in a relationship with God. But God spoke to her heart, revealed himself to her, and said, I've got a mission for you. I've got a plan for you. And he used her to take care of the prophet. Uh, Many years later, by the way, Luke chapter chapter 4 he, he refers to this woman as a great example of faith. <laughs> God had a plan through this. Uh, no Jew in Israel would have given this woman the time of day. And you know what God said? I'll use you. I'll love you. I've got a purpose for you. A very unusual relationship. You know what, though? Th- doesn't God just seem to have a way of doing that? God finds the clay for his wheel in unusual places. You know, when, when Jesus came uh, to, to, to the earth, uh, he, he said, I came to seek and to save the lost. He said, I came to those that are sick and in need, not, not, to, the, not to the rich and the wealthy who don't think they have a need. I, I, I came to the sinner. Uh, and that's what God does. He takes that which nobody else wants, and then he makes something glorious out of it. Look, look through the Bible. Look through history. 
Uh, God just de- takes a common person. Everybody else might have said, there's no hope for them. And God says, oh, yeah, I got a plan. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm God. Put them in my hands, and we'll see what I can do with them. That's what he does with this poor widow lady. Uh, you know, I'm thankful for his saving grace. Amen. And I'm thankful it's available to all sinners. It, it, there's no restriction on it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but we see an unusual relationship. This would not be expected for God to do, but God does it. The second thing you see is an untroubled request. An untroubled request. The brook dries up. The birds leave. Elijah is left in the wilderness with God's command to go to Zarephath. Traveling under the promise that God has already gone ahead of him and commanded a widow woman there in verse number 9 to sustain him. When Elijah arrives in Zarephath, he finds a widow gathering sticks. Uh, He asks the woman in verse number 10 for a drink of water. As she's going to get the water, he says, oh, by the way, I'm a little hungry. I don't don't, don't want a sandwich or anything. Don't make me a pizza. Just, just Just a little bit of bread. Just a little morsel is all I want. Just, just, just something to kind of take the hunger edge off. Can you do that? She tells him in verse number 12 the tale of her woe. <laughs> she, she tells him the problems that she is facing in her life. Her poverty and how she plans to cook what little food she has for her son and her. And then, and then one final meal and then they're going to die of starvation. Elijah hears all this. He listens to her. And like a typical man. He heard, but he didn't listen. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> well, that's because God was involved here, okay? And God had already given Elijah his promise. But his response is quite strange. He says, go ahead and do that. But before you and your son eat, feed me. He, he's got to be a Baptist. Amen? He has to be. I, I was told this morning when I talked about the things we should bring to church, I was told I missed one, a covered dish. Amen. <laughs> that should have been number one because that makes you smile. Amen. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Moving on. <laughs> he, he says, okay, that's fine. Do, that's a good plan. Do that, but give me what you have left. Then after I've eaten, fix for you and your son. Now, I've got a feeling that Elijah probably could have eaten as much as the widow and her son put together. Okay. I mean, so, so in preparing what she was going to prepare for her and her boy was probably enough for Elijah. So when he said, give it to me and then prepare for yourself, in, in my mind, and in her mind, probably was like, there won't be any more. I'm, I'm, I'm going to prepare this and give it all for you. There's not enough. But Elijah knows something that maybe she doesn't. God had already promised to provide his need. God had, always pro- or had already promised that the, through the hands of this widow, uh, he, would, he would take care of Elijah. So that leads me to this thought. If you look at... Um, Verse number 13, after she says that, his first words to her are, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. God is going to honor the sacrifice you made for his man and provide for you because of your faith in in doing so. God is going to provide for me. He's going to provide for you and your son in a miraculous way if you'll just simply trust. If you'll simply trust. Now, again, we saw earlier in the passage, God had already spoken to this woman. He had already told her, uh, there's a man coming and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna prepare. So, so throughout all this, she had already had the foreknowledge. She wasn't quite exactly sure how it was all going to work out. Uh, so Elijah shows up and makes his request. And of course, fear is probably the first thing that comes to her mind. So he says, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God has got that. Let's just simply put, a, put, a, put aside fear and trust God. If God says he's going to provide, God's going to provide. You may not know how. I may not know how. But if God has promised, God will see it to fruition. If God has said it, God will accomplish it. Elijah didn't know exactly how it was going to work. She didn't know. But Elijah knew God always keeps his word. Elijah knew that God was as good as his word. The rain had stopped just like God said it would. He also believed the rain would start when God said it would. Uh, he, he knew that the ravens fa- showed up at the, at the brook and fed him like God said he would. He knew the brook would dry up, and he'd send him to Zarephath, and he'd meet a woman. And sure enough, he walks in the gates, and who's the first person he meets? This woman. So he knew that God would keep his word. He knew little about how, but he knew God would. Elijah was very untroubled with this request. You and I might look at that and say, what a rude dude. You're going to take this woman's last meal? You're not going to let her feed her boy? You want to be fed first? Stingy preacher. Right? Elijah didn't say, well... (laughs) 
I have a sad request. I mean, if you can do this, please, would you? He has no trouble asking for this. He says, fear not, feed me first. Fear not, feed me first. Very bold. Uh, no caution. No hesitancy. Untroubled. Why? Because he knew God was going to provide. He'd seen him do it before. He knew he was going to do it then. He simply knew we have to trust God. In the midst of our fear, in the midst of our impossible situations, God's got it. we got to trust him. And that's how he answers. That's why he asks, just like a casual conversation, feed me first. We look and say, man, that's, that's wrong. He knew why. He was trusting God. Untroubled request. Uh, look at the, the, the third thing there. Let her see. Look at an uneasy response. An uneasy response. Verse number 15. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. The widow simply did exactly what Elijah asked of her. She went to the place. She gathered her sticks. She took the two sticks, that bit of meal, uh, that bit of oil. She prepared a meal for Elijah. She presented a humble present for the Lord in faith. I'll trust him. That's what Elijah said to do. He's talked to God. God has already given me some foreknowledge of this. I'm just going to do it. I wonder. This, this would have been me. <laughs> Even though God had already spoken to me. Even though I was pretty confident in Elijah. I wondered if as she watched him eat her last bit of food. If through her mind ran a question. Will there be any left for us? Are my boy and I going to get to eat before we die? We don't know all the details of the story. We, can, we don't have the exact widow's account here. But regardless of any fear or doubt, she accepted the promise of God. She accepted the fact that if I'll obey the command of God, God will take care of his end. Boy, and isn't that true in Christianity? If we'll just simply trust and obey, God always keeps his end of the bargain. And when we don't get the blessings of God, it's not because God decided to withhold them. It's because I didn't trust and obey. And we have this widow, Zarephath, saying, I'm going to step out in faith. I'm putting my life and my boy's line on the life without a last meal. And I'm going to trust. I'm going to have faith. And I'm going to put it out there. This, this, this woman's faith, I'm just going to say this. This is in the mountain moving faith category. You know, God talks about we have faith as a grain of mustard seed. We can move a mountain, right? This is that kind of faith. She has literally planned to die that day with her boy. She's planned to eat one last meal and starve to death. By the way, what a way to die. Can you imagine that? But that was her plan. And she simply says, okay, I'll trust God. I'll step out and I'll do, uh, even though I'm facing something impossible, I'm going to do what God's asked me to do. You know, I don't know what you might face in your life from time to time that appears impossible. But I do know this. We will face impossible times. We'll face times before we, before we pass off this earth. We look at things and say, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know who's going to step in here. And, and we've got to fully, 100% rely on God. Uh, knowing that, I want you to know this. Just like Elijah knew, God can be trusted. He, he's blessed you in the past. Many of you testified it to, about it tonight. Uh, last Sunday night and the Sunday night before. And the Sunday night. God's blessed us in the past. He's not about to change now. He provides for his children in the past. He's going to provide for us today. Uh, we can trust God. We can always trust God. We have the promise of his watch care and his provision and him taking care of us in our lives. But we have to trust him even in impossible times. Uh, he will give you grace to handle everything that comes your way. It's not always easy. But, but Corinthians tells us in chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. He'll give us that grace. He'll meet the needs that arise in our life. He'll, he'll, he'll walk with us every step of the way. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, when, sa when danger rises against me, he'll safely bring me through. He, when I can't walk, he'll carry me. Amen? That's God. He uses every pain and every problem and every pit stop or pitfall in life to develop us to make me more like Jesus. Romans 8, 28, if you can't claim it for anything, all things work together for good to make me more like Jesus. <laughs> to make me more like Jesus. That's his goal. That's his, that's his will for every person is to get saved and be more like Jesus. And be more like Jesus. And be more like Jesus. And, and so even dealing with these impossible situations, he uses those to make me more like Jesus. To make me more like Christ. He uses those. Uh, we have promise after promise after promise after promise in Scripture. We don't have the promise to have a smooth life. If that's in your Bible, I would like for you to show it to me. It ain't there. We don't have the promise of an easy life or a pain-free life or a problem-free life. Uh, we do have the promise, though, that if we'll trust him, he'll provide. 
If we'll trust him, he'll meet our needs. If we'll trust him, the God of the impossible will show up in the impossible situation and take care of it. If we'll simply trust him. We see a hopeless predicament, a humble present. Let me get this last thought. Number three. Number three. Look at a heavenly provision. A heavenly provision. The widow, in verse 15 and 16, she obeyed God. And you know what God did? He honored his promise. He did exactly what he said he would do. God told Elijah they would be fed, and they were. God, again, was as good as his word in this situation. In whatever situation you're in, he's as good as his word. I, I don't, again, I don't fully understand how this works. It's the, it's the, it's the miraculous working ability and power of God. Uh, but I know that after the widow fed Elijah, she went back, and she opened up the barrel, and guess what? There was more meal. And she went to the cruise of oil, and she opened it up, and there's more oil. And, and, and every time she opened the, the meal, there was more. And every time she opened the oil, there was more. There was never a shortage of supply. Every time she opened it, it was replenished. Well, wouldn't you like to have a cupboard and a refrigerator like that today? Amen. The peanut butter pie just never runs out. You open the door, and there it is. Amen. <laughs> Uh, the the T-bone steaks, man, they just keep on coming. Amen? Think about it. You talk about an answer, a heavenly answer, uh, an answer that can only be attributed to the power and the provision of an almighty God. Every time she went back, there was, there was food available. Every time. I, I'm sure, again, after she fed Elijah, she may have wondered, is there going to be food for us? And she went back and opened up. Where did that come from? There's more? And she was able to feed herself and her son. For the next three years, for the next three years, until rain came again and the drought went away, every time she went to find meal, there it was. And every time she went to find oil, there it was. And every time she sat her son down and said, it's lunchtime, and she went and opened those containers to make that food, there was always enough. There was always plenty. For the next three years. I don't know how God did it. But he did it. Uh, she would take some out and God would put more in. <laughs> they never missed a meal. I'm sure many around them starved to death during the famine. They never missed a meal. God took care of them during this hopeless situation. You know, I, 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 I'll give you a couple thoughts about that real quick. Number one. Serving God from an empty barrel. Does a whole lot more to fill my barrel than trying to fill it myself. You ever, you ever, you, 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 we've talked about this in, in uh, Nehemiah before where they, they went to rebuild the, the temple and they started on their houses and they quit on the temple, remember? And it talked about how they were earning money, but it was like in a bag with holes in it. Yeah. You ever try to just fill yourself, try to do something, and it's just like, it's like everything's just in, in and out, in and out, in and out, and you like never accomplish anything? Serving God with an empty, here am I, God, you fill me, you use me goes a whole lot farther and faster and is used in a whole lot better better way when I let him fill me instead of me trying to fill myself. That's what this lady did, this widow. Uh, I, I'm going to forget about me, and I'm just going to put myself in the capable hands of an almighty God. He'll take care of me. I'm going to stop trying to solve my own problems. Amen. I'm going to park there for just a little while. I, I'm going to stop trying to fix everything that I'm having a problem with in my life. And I'm just going to take my life to God. I'm going to say, God, I make my problems worse when I try to solve them. I'm just going to faithfully rest in the assurance that you're going to provide for me and take care of me. I'm going to stop worrying about problems. I'm going to stop trying to fix all those things. Serving God from an empty barrel does more to fill the barrel than, than trying to fill it myself. Number two, my, uh, my two sticks, my meal, my oil will accomplish very little. But when I put it in the hands of God... He sure can do something great with it. There's no way in the world that woman could have had more meal and more oil like it happened. Other than the hand of God. She was planning to die. But she used the two sticks and the meal and the oil. Fed the man of God. Obeyed God's command. And he supplied thousands of meals. Um, again, I'm not real smart, but I own a calculator. Two people eating three meals a day for three years. That's over 6,500 meals. Now, I want you ladies to stop and think about that for just a minute. You ladies that cook. 
or, or you men, if you men cook, 6,500 meals. Can you imagine the trips to the grocery store? Now, of course, they didn't have that back then, but the open market back then, or killing your own food back then. Can you imagine the time preparing each meal? 6,500 meals? She never had to worry. Do I have enough money to go to Walmart and buy my groceries? Uh, is it going to be in stock? Or is there a shortage of it? She never worried about it. She simply went and found God's provision. Each and every time. That's God. A heavenly provision. What a miracle. The, the, the point I want to make, and in, in, in this, this, I'll, I'll kind of close with this thought. We have to, like the lady, like the woman here, this widow, we have to learn to let go of the sticks. I, I thought about this and I thought, first of all, how big of a fire could she have made to cook with with two sticks? <laughs> Not that big, right? <laughs> but boy, when she gave that to God and the meal and the oil, God said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to multiply that for three years. I'm going to multiply it. If we'll put what we have in the hand of God, it may not seem like much to us. God can do some mighty big things with it. Well, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. What will we do with our sticks? You know, I, Emily brought me the two probably puniest sticks on the entire campus of our church. What, what, what will you do with your sticks? Right? Because to me, I look at this and I was like, that won't even, that's not even good kindling right there, right? That's nothing. Throw that in the trash. But you know what, when I, when, I, when I place those in the hands of an almighty God, isn't it awesome to watch him provide in ways I never even can fathom? I don't expect. And then when he does, I just look back and say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. And we face these situations in our life that humans look at and say, there's no hope. That is impossible. And if I'll just simply say, well, I'll take the impossibility of these two little sticks and I'll put them into the, God, the hands of the creator of the universe and I'll let him work, it's amazing how quickly the impossible turns possible. All David had was a shepherd slain and a few stones. But in the hand of God, he killed a giant. All Moses had was a staff and in the hand of God, he parted a sea. All a little boy had was five loaves and two fishes, and in the hand of God, he fed 10,000 plus people with it. All the widow had was two sticks, but in the hand of God, he fed her family for three years. See, God doesn't need a lot to work with. You know, you know in creation, he took nothing and made everything. <laughs> he took nothing and made everything. These scientists today that talk about how we're creating this and we're creating that, you ain't creating nothing because you're starting with something. That's not creation. That's fabrication. Okay? There's a difference. God created this world out of nothing. Now, if he can use nothing to make everything, don't you think he can take the little two sticks that I had to present and do something big with it? Because at least it's something. Put them in the hands of God. When we do, everything changes. Everything changes. There was a man, he was known as Chaplain Robinson. I don't know his first name, but he shared a, a, a true story about his grandmother that took place in 1949. His father had just returned from World War II. Uh, on every American highway, you could see soldiers in uniform hitchhiking home to their families, as kind of was the custom during that day. Sadly, the thrill of his reunion with his family was overshadowed by the illness of Robinson's grandma. The problem was her kidneys. The doctor told Robinson's father that she needed a blood transfusion immediately or she would not live through the night. The problem was that his grandmother's blood type was AB negative. A very rare type of blood then and even today. Harder to get back then. They didn't have blood banks or, or, or uh, 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 able to fly and ship things to places the way we do now. None of the family members had matching blood. The doctors gave the family no hope. Said she will not survive through the night without this transfusion. Robinson's father left the hospital in tears. 
gathered all the family members together so they could go say goodbye to grandmother. As Robinson's father was driving down the highway, he tells a story about passing a soldier that was hitchhiking home to his family. He was deep in grief at the time and had no, no inclination to give this man a ride, but something strongly impressed upon his heart to pick that stranger up and give him a ride. He let the man into the vehicle, and as they were driving, he was so upset, he didn't even ask the soldier's name. Never thought about it. Just continued to drive. The soldier noticed, however, the tears in the man's eyes and the distraught look upon his face, and he asked Robinson what was wrong. Through the tears, Robinson's father told this stranger about his dying mother uh, in the hospital. They could not give her a a blood transfusion of AB negative blood because they didn't have any, and by morning, she would be dead. It got very quiet and surreal in the car. Then this unidentified soldier extended out his hand to Robinson's father with his palm upward. Resting in the palm of his hand were his dog tags with his blood type engraved on them, AB negative. He told Robinson, turn the car around, get us to the hospital. I'll give a blood transfusion to save grandma's life. And he did. Robinson's grandmother lived until 1996. 47 years later, nobody in that family knows the name of that soldier. To this day, Robinson's father thinks God sent an angel in uniform to provide for an impossible situation. Folks, we know uh, God keeps his promises, but we never know how. We never know when. We never know what situations he's going to use. We never know. What just offering our two sticks might do. We never know when we say, hey God, listen, this is, this is all I got. We never know when God will say, you know what? That's all I need. I'll take that. You put it in my hands. And I'll turn the impossibility into possibility. And into power. Into provision. Into reward. Uh, when we get our sticks in the hands of God, everything else changes. I don't know today what you might be facing. I don't know what impossible situation you might be looking at, having come out of or going into. I don't know. But whatever that need or that situation might be today, I just want to encourage you, like the widow. Uh, in your hands, that, those sticks and that meal and that, and that uh, oil may not amount to anything. But if we'll put it in God's hands, man, man what God can do. If we'll just simply let him, and if we'll trust him, and if we'll step out in faith and say, here you go, God, you can have what little I have, and I'll let you do the rest. And boy, he sure does love doing the rest, doesn't he? But I got to be willing to surrender it to him. This widow is a shining example of putting faith in God and saying, here you are, I'll give you what I have. You know, most of us, if we were to look at our lives, would probably say, I don't have much to offer you, God. I'm not rich. I'm not famous. I'm not good looking. I'm not a good orator. I'm not, you fill in the blank. But God, whatever I am, whatever I have, is yours. And if you'll use me, I'll let you. If you'll use me, I'm willing. And if you'll do big things with me, I'm all yours. It's amazing to let God work in the middle of an impossible situation and to see what he can do with us if we'll just simply surrender to him. Every one of you has at least two sticks. If you don't, you can have these after the service. (laughs) Every one of you has some sticks in life, all right? What will you do with them? What will you do with them? You can can be stingy and hang on to them. No, these are for me, Elijah. I'm going to feed my boy and and myself. They're for me. I'm not sharing. Or you can say, here you go, God. Here you go, God. It's yours. Let me watch you work. I love watching him work. Will you watch him work? We see an impossible situation, and God turns it into a supernatural smorgasbord. And for three years, those those two eat off this little bitty containers for three years. For three years, three meals a day, God provides. Now again, it might not be that situation in your life, but whatever it is, we can trust God. We can trust God. He knows what he's doing. He'll provide for us as he always has and he always will. Uh, next week, we're going to look at, um, oh, those are those two things I already told you. Let me get them off of here for you. 
Next week, mission completed this week. Next week, uh, mission of the accused adulterer in John chapter number 8. And uh, we'll look at that next week and see another impossible situation that God steps into and does something pretty amazing in. And uh, so if you want to read ahead, you can do that and know where we're coming from next, uh, next service. So any questions? We get all the blanks filled in. Questions, thoughts? Thought? Preach that some Sunday morning? <laughs> all right, you guys act like you haven't heard it before. And I'll preach that on Sunday morning, all right? <laughs> I'm sure I can work it out, mix it up a little bit. So, Amen. All right, let's pray. We'll be dismissed then tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provision. And Lord, I thank you that uh, you even give us a little in life. And Lord, if we'll truly turn around and give that little back to you, you can do so many amazing things with us and with what we've surrendered. Help us, Lord, to be people of faith who step out like this widow did and, and just says, here, here, here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I. Use my talents. Here am I. Use my belongings, Lord, for whatever you want. I sacrifice them to you. Lord, we know that you'll do that and you'll work in a miraculous and a powerful way in our lives if we'll trust you and step out. Help us, please, to gain some encouragement and some guidance from this widow's life here in the book of Kings, I pray. Father, we ask you tonight as we go to our homes to give us safety, please, as we travel. Uh, bless our week. Bless us, uh, the services on Wednesday. And we just ask that you'll help us to live for you this week and be a shining testimony of the goodness of God in our lives to others, we pray. We thank you again for all you've done. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for what you'll continue to do for us this week. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Goodbye and God bless you. Shake a couple hands on your way out. And we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday.